I tugged on my mother's arm, struggling, alongside the grocery cart filled with Captain Crunch and frozen lima beans, asking for the candy we just passed. Stop asking, Omar! My mother only ever really communicated at one volume, a really loud one. My little brother, dark brown curly hair and freckles accenting his small face, was sitting in the shopping cart with his feet sticking through those, those little square holes in the, in the grocery carts, limping next to me with a gait characteristic of a child with cerebral palsy, my, my sister pleaded to get the toy she wanted. No luck. Just ahead of us, my older brother, sandy blonde, shoulder-length hair, still matted from water polo practice, turns and groans like only a teenager can. Are we almost done? In the next moment, something happened that it would take years for me to understand. All of us seemed to yell, Mom! At the same moment, and then I noticed the looks on the faces of the adults nearby. I couldn't place it at the time, but even then I knew it was some sort of bewildered look. Why, I wondered, were they think, looking with such curiosity at a family walking through a grocery store? My little brother sitting next to me in the grocery cart was a Latino boy with light brown skin. My sister, born with a birth defect and broken speech, was Jewish. My older brother, my mom's only biological child with us on that day, was a white teenager, and I, as you can probably see, am black. The looks of wonder and curiosity that I couldn't place at such a young age became clearer over time. I'd see them more and more often, I could read that, why is that white lady carrying that child? Look well by the time I was seven or eight years old. I'm gonna just adjust this a little bit. Even though I didn't understand it completely, sprinkle in more than 100 foster brothers and sisters over the course of my life, uh, different shapes and skin colors, medical conditions that I've had, and my house might really have been the original Rainbow Coalition. <laughs> Growing up in an environment where most of my brothers and sisters were black or brown, but my parents and oldest brothers were white, created an emotional footprint about personal identity that I imagine is, for most, uh, more fluid than most. My brother married a Filipino woman, and because of the age difference between she and I, she was more like an aunt or a surrogate parent than, than an in-law. The same is true for my Latino in-laws, whose family have shaped much of my view of the world and the cultural identifiers in my life. Yes, for us, and my wife's in the back, there's lumpia, tamales, and literally everybody in a room being an auntie or an uncle is a, just a core part of who I am. Returning to the early years, my mother's favorite story of my young life revolves around bath time as a toddler. She'd run the Cookie Monster bubble bath and sort of drop me into a heavy sea of this lukewarm water. There were action figures, you know, bubbles coming up all over the place. And once I settled in, she stepped away to go around and get a towel. And when she came back, I had covered my, my hands, my, my arms, my head, and just my whole face with these white bubbles. And I was just peering through these little holes. And she looked at me, and this time she decided not to yell. She said, what are you doing, silly? She said with kind of a chuckle, and I looked at her, and I said, I'm making myself white like you, Mom. Right? It's, a, it's okay to laugh, right? Like, that's one of those things. It's like, oh, it's a push and the pull. It's, it's, but let that sit for a minute, right? The, in, in, the innocence and complexity of that statement out of the mouth of a two-and-a-half-year-old is wild. Comedians used to write whole comedy sketches making fun of Michael Jackson for, quote, wanting to be white. For blacks and Latinos, we actually have names like Oreo and Cookie, specifically designed to, uh, you know, make fun of people who don't fit some mold of what sort of conventional wisdom in our communities thinks is appropriate. I remember two guys in junior high school who had a problem with the way I spoke. Uh, I was maybe seventh grade and these two kids, we'll call them Cookie and Cream because why not have fun since, you know. <laughs> anyway, so Cookie comes up to me and he says, roses are red, violets are blue, Cream and I are black. How about you? Oof. And there it was. What did it mean to be black? Was it something you could define with a Fresh Prince of Bel-Air anecdote, which is basically what they were doing? Another story from the same year, I was in PE, you know, you're seventh grade, it's first time in the PE. I come out, I've got baggy shorts and, you know, just regular clothes, whatever shoes that my mother could sort of, you know, conjure. 
I get out there, there's this moment, I'm all set, ready to go, and this kid looks at me and he points at my knees and goes, damn, you ashy. If you don't know what ash is, like probably what, like a couple people in here are like, yeah, yeah. If you don't know what it is, find yourself a black friend or make yourself a black friend and ask. <laughs> hmm. Hmm. Anyway, suffice it to say, those two episodes were not unrelated. Nor, if you saw my childhood pictures before I actually had a black foster brother that was able to take me to a proper barber shop, was the <laughs> horrible shape my hair was in when I was a little kid. No. Suffice it to say, the push and pull of racial dynamics uh, in this country is rough. And when my white parents, not a high school education between them, decided to adopt me at age six, that struggle played itself out with black social workers in San Diego fighting the adoption because my parents happened to be white. This struggle of race and what it means tried hard to dominate the early years of my life. And it exists not just across racial groups, but often within them as well. I remember a teacher at O'Farrell where I went to high school, where I went to school in southeastern San Diego. His name was Donald Robinson. He was a dance teacher. Strong, masculine, unafraid to stand his ground or get in your face if needed, and a black man. And he said something to me I've never forgotten. He said that the reality of being black in America is that there's not just one version of it. And you don't need to be concerned with what one individual might say or do. Be who you are and be comfortable with that. It stayed with me. And if you think about the image of, you know, if you think about fame or one of those TV shows, a just strong black man in tights saying this to you, right, it, at 13, 14 years old, it, it, it really stuck with me. Early in high school, I moved to a small rural town from San Diego where I felt the sting of real in-your-face racism and the warmth of strangers. This was all from people who looked the same on the outside but were really quite different. I could tell an entire additional story about what it's like to be called nigger. What it's like to have an opposing coach, I played high school football and college football, to have an opposing coach scream as I'm running down the sideline, get that nigger. I can say what it's like to catch the winning touchdown and have one of my own teammates run up to me and say, man, you're a great nigger. It's okay to laugh at that, right? That's one of those situations where it's uncomfortable, but he just didn't have the emotional facility, right, to, just to, to, to congratulate me without a, a racial slur. Anyway. <laughs> Many of those people who had such limited experiences with black people in that town actually have turned, uh, perhaps in part because of social media and just life in general, into terrific adults. I know that sounds strange to sort of look back at an ex experiences like that and, and view them the way that I do, but I guess I have a really large capacity for forgiveness and I'm really happy about the way that ended. Anyway, despite those challenges, the next three decades of my life left me with something that some might consider a surprising view of America and what I'd call our shared identity. In the fall of 1993, I crossed the country to go to Morehouse College, a tiny male, uh, all-male liberal arts college, best known for being across the quad from an all-women's college, if you know the area, uh, and also the alma mater of Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Bless you. I was crossing the country with no family, no friends, and really no idea of what I was getting myself into. Uh, and this isn't a story about how Morehouse was sort of created in the wake of the end of uh, slavery to provide an ed some educational opportunities. It's actually the story about a 30-something white couple, a liberal Jewish New Yorker and a conservative Nazarene Christian Midwestern guy, and what they represent in that concept of a shared identity. I can't tell this story without talking about those two people, Wendy and Kevin Best. When I got off the plane in my journey to Atlanta, Alone and curious about the future, the first friendly face I saw was one I didn't even recognize. Wendy came up with a huge hug and a smile as if we'd known each other for years. Behind her, reserved but friendly, stood her husband Kevin, a mountain of a man, a former college basketball player. He greeted me with a warm handshake and, and over the next two years they would demonstrate on more occasions than I can remember a thing about identity that I have come to see over and over again in my life since those days. I was connected to Wendy and Kevin only loosely through a, my sister-in-law's sister's, sister's uh, college roommate 30 years before that. But Wendy ended up being a tremendous influence on me at the time and I didn't realize it until years later. That influence wasn't about race or gender or religion. 
The person Wendy was at her core, her identity, transcended all those markers. It wasn't her Jewishness nor her liberalness that caused her to stand in as a surrogate parent and help me lug a you know, chest of ratty clothes up flights of stairs in the muggy August Georgia weather to start college. Kevin's conservative views and white skin weren't the things that caused him to drive across the city at like 35. So now I'm older, right? I was like 41. I'm thinking what it must have been like to, to decide that you're going to take your Saturday and instead of hanging out with your wife or doing whatever we all do, you're going to drive across the town to pick up some kid that you don't know uh, to hang out for great meals and, and good conversation. It, that's just a kindness that, that has really stuck with me and resonated. I stood up here, a black man raised by white parents, with a heavily influential Filipino and Latino family, wrapping their arms around me and each other over the course of my 41 years. I stood up here, the son of a deaf, abused, broken, mentally ill woman who was homeless on the streets of San Diego. And I could tell an entire different conversation about my biological mother, a black woman whose poverty and lifetime of abuse really shaped another part of my identity that didn't even emerge until I was well into adulthood. I stood up here with all these obvious external signs about what my identity would be. And maybe that's what you saw. But the truth is that my identity is as much about that kindness of spirit I was talking about earlier as anything. My identity is, is your identity. It's the identity that we all share. Every single person in this room who has taken a moment to do something that they didn't have to do because it was right and kind. Sometimes you go to these types of things and expect tragedy and just real, this notion of having to overcome. And unfortunately for many people in our society, that is the reality and that is the experience that they have. But my truth and my identity are wrapped in a lifetime of people who chose to do good things just because they can. From the time I was 10 months old, my earliest memories are of a stranger with a big heart deciding to care about me for no good reason. My childhood is wrapped in layers of stories of the mothers and fathers of friends, the teachers and little league coaches and random strangers of all races and colors doing things that made my life better, better than it otherwise would have been. I entered adulthood with a Jewish stranger and her conservative Christian husband making their lives for a short time about my comfort and security. Even now as a full-fledged adult, right, I see neighbors and friends and volunteers who go out of their way to take care, to care, take care of one another. They are black and Latino and Filipino and white and Korean and mixed race and Muslim and atheist and gay and straight and old and young. And their kindness is the one thing that they all share in common. Their core can't be seen from a quick glance on the street. Let this space be those few minutes when it's okay to remember that people really do care and we really do try, that the ugliness we see and hear and read in the news isn't the reality of who we are as people. I was raised around a tremendous amount of abuse for the, the foster children that became my brothers and sis sisters. That sickness and those painful experiences um, didn't leave me feeling a sense of sorrow. It actually just created in me an empathy and a clear vision of a shared identity of what people like my mother Phyllis could actually create. It caused me to see those kindnesses of who we are and who we can choose to be as the true marker of our shared identity. Thank you.